Um, Your Royal Highness, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives us a great pleasure and honour to be here to, uh, to speak on uh, something that's very close to my heart. Um, this morning I'm going to give a very brief overview of the current trends in urbanisation and what it means for health. As you know, um, we all hear that we're living in an urban world, but what actually does it mean? When we dig down, urban is a, is a term, it's a continuum, which needs probably to be understood better if we're to fully appreciate um, our interventions, what we can do to improve people's health. Um, as we speak at the moment, about uh, just over half of uh, the population of the world live in urban areas. That's gone up dramatically since the 1950s. But the news is that it's going to be nearly three-quarters of the world's population uh, by 2050. The rate of urbanization and the level of urbanization is different depending on where you go in the world. And although in sort of America uh, and in uh, Latin America and the Caribbean uh, and in Europe, the levels of urbanization are already quite high, uh, in Africa and Asia, there's still this huge potential for urbanization. You can see that the levels there are quite low, but they will go up much, much faster. Additionally, um, most of the megacities are in the global south. I mean, in, in countries like China and India and Brazil, we uh, commonly hear of, uh, of populations in excess of, you know, five, ten uh, million. Many millions of people live in, in the global south. Um, but a lot of urban dwellers actually live in smaller urban centres, urban centres between one and five million. And it's actually these fastest growing urban centres where is the greatest risk that the urbanisation can proceed in an unsustainable way. And you may well say, well, what implication does that have for, for health? What implications does that have for services? But it has so, it so much relates to uh, what we can offer, what we can offer people, that it's very important to understand uh, how this urbanisation process is going ahead. Within the urban populations, and I mean, if we look uh, globally, uh, we can see that a large number of those urban dwellers actually live in low-income informal settlements. You can see some figures here uh, from uh, for urbanization from 2000 to 2012, and you can see very clearly that sub-Saharan Africa is very high up there with the proportion of people living in informal settlements. Those are people who don't have access to clean water and sanitation, they don't have a decent house, they don't have any legal tenure to where they live. But what's probably even more important is that the almost the highest uh, proportion of people living in slums is in areas that are in conflict. And the reason is because when there's conflicts, people migrate to the urban areas because that's where they find some security, but they find better access to services, access to basic services, but access to health care. And of course, we know with the current uh, levels of conflicts going on around the world that this isn't going to change anytime soon. So in reality, although the proportion of slums, as you can see here, is slightly decreasing. It did slightly decrease over that period. In real terms, of course, the numbers are still very high. But most importantly, the areas in conflict in the world are the ones that are going to experience some explosive urbanization. So you've got two groups, really, that we're worried about. We're worried about the small urban centers in Africa, particularly in Asia, which are undergoing very rapid expansion, and also the region's urban areas which are, are receiving people from conflicts. Um, and you can see there, I mean, even in places where we know conflicts are very bad in, in Sudan and southern Sudan, that, you know, the largest proportion of urban population there is huge. Mo the vast majority of the people uh, are there are, are living in low-income areas. But as I said earlier, urban is a, is a definition, it's a very broad definition, and urban areas vary from very, very large urban centers um, the sorts of big cities that we know in Africa, like, for example, Lagos in Nigeria, down to large urban centers that have resulted from conurbation of smaller uh, urban centers. Good examples there are the Accra uh, Tama region in Ghana and Metro Manila, places I'm sure you are familiar with. Then uh, also, uh, in particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, there are large uh, uh, places where there are smaller urban centers. Uh, in Lake Victoria Basin is a good example, where in the, in the riparian area around the Lake Victoria, there's something like 300 uh, small uh, towns or small urban centers. And of course, then you've got people living in a, an urban existence, but in a village. 
So this is the reason why urban is quite a difficult thing to understand, because it's actually a, a graduation across many different things. I wanted to just show you now what happens if you dig deeper within an urban area to see what the inequities are like in provision of services. Um, His Royal Highness mentioned about inequity in all societies, including here in Europe, but this is typically what you would see uh, in, uh, in, a, in a small African uh, town, an old small city. This is a case of Mutakula in, in Tanzania. The, the highest figure uh, on the bar uh, in 2007 and 2010 represents the official statistics on the coverage of water. The coverage, the statistics that are produced by WHO and JMP say that in that small town in 2007, 86% of people had access to clean water. If you actually dig deeper down into that definition and you look at what uh, uh, access to an improved drinking water source means, and if you say, first off, uh, well, uh, if you spend more than 10% of your income uh, on that water, it's not acceptable. Most of us will be horrified if we had to pay 10% of our income uh, just to get clean water. If you put that uh, condition onto the results, you find that the coverage drops down to 40%. If you then ask the question, how long does it take you to get that drinking water, and it's actually longer than an hour, it drops down to 20%. Um, and then if you talk about the quantity of water, if it's less than 20 litres that's available, it drops down to 20%. So the reality is uh, the people in these low-income areas, mainly uh, young women and children, are actually having he really, really poor levels of coverage of water. So the official statistics say one thing, what's actually happening on the ground is completely different. So many of these survey instruments that we use don't take account of what's going on in an urban setting. And we have now, uh, all many countries have signed up to the Sustainable Development Goals, but the demographic and health surveys that we use to get this information on in informal settlements doesn't cover low-income areas. So there's a whole group of the population who are not counted, who don't have access to service. They are covered in census data, of course, in most countries, but censuses are only done every 10 years. So the reality is that the situation is actually quite worse. If you don't have this data and you don't know about the inequities that exist in your country, you can't make decisions about investment. You don't know which areas of the towns, which areas of the country need to be uh, given improved services. And ye these inequities are masked by looking at national statistics. So we've really got to ask the question, as we say at the SDGs, are we leaving anyone behind? And if the answer is yes, we are. We're leaving aside the urban poor. The other issue about um, uh, urban and about infrastructure provision is that this idea about how uh, urbanization goes ahead uh, is very, very important. When we get what we call urban sprawl, inefficient, inefficient urbanization, we find that it becomes very expensive to provide services. That's because when you provide people with uh, water and sanitation or primary health care or garbage collection, if you have a, a poorly designed urban area which is sprawled, it's expensive on a per capita basis to give services. And the difference between a low-density urban area and a, a low-density rural area and urban area is something like 200 times the difference in cost per capita for the provision of services. So this somehow explains why, as we go to reduce densities in urban areas, why we find that infrastructure, services, accesses to primary health care are, in fact, a uh, lot less satisfactory than they should be. But on the other hand, if we're designing cities to be healthy places and we need open space, which we all know is important for uh, child development. Uh, this is also pulling against the idea of, of compact cities. So this is really where the challenge lies. It's the difference between, on the one hand, providing open space and a free environment for everybody to live in a clean, healthy area, uh, against the other side of having a density of population to uh, make the uh, cost effectiveness of service provision more effective. So I wanted to just go back a little bit to uh, learning from the past and if we think very carefully about what used to happen. Um, for those of you who uh, may be uh, are aware, are not aware, um, the planning of Manhattan uh, and the current grid system of roads that we see there today in New York um, actually has its origins back in the uh, 1800s. 
And basically, the whole purpose behind the laying out of the Manhattan grid was from a health perspective, because in those days, Manhattan was almost, not a slum exactly, but it was a very unplanned urban area. And it was a group of commissioners, very quickly, all this time ago, who designed this grid system that we enjoy today, and the purpose was to improve the circulation of air and to stave off diseases, because um, in those days, they used to think that a lot of disease was transmitted through this miasma theory, which was, uh, which was poor quality air. So the whole purpose of the designing of Manhattan was a health initiative to improve the setting. And I mean, if you look at it today, it was designed before motor vehicles were around, and even that's, that structure has worked today. You can actually apply some of these rules uh, to... Uh, low-income settlements, and they can be used. <coughs> the same principles that were looked at for the planning of Manhattan, improving the levels of service, you can apply to low-income areas. And this is a, a project which uh, we were involved in uh, as part of a community-led slum upgrading program in uh, the, one of the biggest slums in sub-Saharan Africa, in uh, Kibera, Nairobi, where um, we looked at using the community, particularly women and their families, to help design the sorts of slum upgrading that they wanted. And what was interesting about this initiative, although uh, they obviously wanted access to basic services, uh, including water, sanitation, and drainage, the most important thing for them was the provision of a proper access road. So we actually went into uh, this slum, and with a lot of work with the communities, we planned out how we could um, provide them with the basic facilities that they needed but uh, provide them with a road at the same time. And the interesting point now, this was done, by the way, back in 2008. If you go back there today, you will find that this uh, approach and design has been replicated in many, many other slums. And the road becomes the open space in the evening where people congregate. So this idea of using streets as a way to upgrade slums uh, and to provide more facilities is very, very important. One other thing that's very interesting about this is the whole design now of the housing in this uh, low-income settlement uh, has been uh, prioritized uh, for the women and children because the women were the ones who decided uh, because of their young children and because they needed to uh, manage the uh, responsibility of having a job in the first place, uh, petty trading and market stalls, with managing their small children, it um, influenced the design of this system, the road system and the houses. So again, these principles are the same, the idea of this space being designed effectively. This concept, as I say, has now been uh, replicated um, and uh, it's improved not just physical health but also the mental condition by providing this space. And if you want to look at the situation from the air, you can see the new road going in there like an artery into the low-income area and the blue roofs around it are the various other community centres, uh, primary healthcare facilities which were added using this road as an artery. So there's a good example there of how uh, some of these ideas from the past can be brought up to present day to improve the lives of the poor. I now wanted to look at the top 10 list of global health threats um, and really just look at all of those, all 10 of them, and to see which ones are of relevance uh, both to urban areas and uh, to child health. So um, they're, they're not in any particular order of preference, but I think the first point, as you know, air pollution now is one of the biggest killers worldwide. And, you know, 90% of people in the world live polluted air on a daily basis. We know that this is one of the huge risks to health, but we know it's also something we can do, uh, do a lot about. So this idea of redesigning our urban space, air pollution is top of the list, both for uh, urban health and for child health. Non-communicable diseases, I'm not going to talk so much about that because um, Fiona will be speaking on that in a moment, but basically the idea of urban design, exercise, healthy lifestyle is very important. There is a threat of a global um, pandemic of, uh, of, of flu. Again, in dense urban areas, these types of diseases can spread very easily and a good urban design can protect against that. I think we've mentioned already about the fragile uh, urban settings, particularly the ones where people from conflict come into urban areas. So yet again, many of those uh, children uh, who are coming into urban areas from conflict zones uh, are at risk. And actually, UNICEF have done a, 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 they've got a new initiative which has just started called uh, Children Under Fire, which has shown 
that those children who are in conflict situations are much more likely to die of lack of access to basic services, to water and sanitation, than they are from being killed in the conflict. So there's a good example of how uh, these vulnerable uh, populations are very uh, there. Antimicrobial resistance, uh, we now know that there's going to be lots of uh, situations where some of the treatable diseases, some of the childhood diseases that we um, used to hear about in Victorian times uh, will now come again and they will be a major cause of death if we don't do something about AMR. Um, Ebola is, of course, another highly infectious disease. We've seen uh, what happens in rural areas with the disease. We're not quite sure what will happen if, heaven forbid, we have an outbreak in an urban area. We can't imagine, but it would be absolutely tragic. Um, and just quickly, I know I'm running out of time, uh, the uh, access to primary health care, again, this is a critical issue in dense urban slums, in, in poorly planned urban areas. Uh, the issue of uh, vaccine, vaccination and, and hesitancy, of course, this has a, a been a popular thing in Europe with many parents uh, not taking advantage of the protective effects of vaccines. One I would like to mention about, which is extremely important, is the threat of emerging vector-borne disease. I've done quite a lot of work on this, and dengue fever in particular is one of the things that we're really worried about. Dengue fever is actually spread by poor environmental management. There's no cure for dengue, but the hemorrhagic fever uh, form that affects very young children and the elderly uh, is, uh, is, is very deadly. So dengue is a threat that's around the corner, and of course, uh, we wouldn't be complete if we didn't include HIV. Um, we're running behind time, so I'm going to just quickly move through these next couple of slides. Basically, one was just about uh, the, the idea of low-cost water testing and the means of having this disaggregated data to enable us to understand what's happening in dense urban areas. Um, and I think I should just move to my concluding comments because basically we're, we're a bit behind time. Urbanisation is suffering from uh, lots of pressures, basically climate change and conflict. So aside from population increases, we have to factor in uh, climate change and conflict when we're understanding urban populations and what they need in services. If we don't have disaggregated data in urban areas, it will be impossible for us to plan intervention strategies. So we have to move much closer to get um, you know, disaggregated data to use all means possible to collect this information. We hear a lot about cell phone apps and community uh, structures, citizen science to help give us some of this data. Without this data, we can't make decisions either about um, health interventions that we need or the sorts of infrastructure that we need to reduce uh, the risk from health. The density of urban uh, space and the way that unplanned urbanisation is going ahead is very worrying because on the one hand we've got the need for good urban densities to ensure service provision is, is effective but we also must factor in the need for open space and planning. So it's essential, depending on where you are in the world and what's available, that we understand that critical balance to design urban space which is much more effective. Um, Children and youth are some of the most vulnerable in society, as we know. And if you look at the current threats that we've just mentioned for communicable diseases, non-communicable diseases, and for mental health, you'll see that the children and youth are the ones that are affected most, and they're most at risk. Um, so, you know, we have to consider these biggest health threats in the frame of child health and understand it. And I think my final point, which I'm sure... I'm preaching a little bit to the converted, but the role of improving uh, health in urban areas will increasingly go beyond the medical profession. It will be up to urban planners, designers, um, those interested in social, understanding social problems in communities. All these people will play a much greater role in the planning of interventions to improve uh, the health of urban populations in the future, and particularly uh, with children. So I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention. Stay. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. <clears throat> Any questions, short comments from the audience? Could someone, if so, raise your hands? You get, when you get the microphone. Any comments to what you heard? Yes, please. A microphone here, please. In the front. Is coming. 
I thought it was interesting that you said about the statistics, uh, that we will need like uh, common people to go around with iPhones or, or application. Could you say something more about that? Yeah. Is that happening Yes, today? most definitely. I mean, we, we've been doing quite a lot of work to promote this, um, in, particularly in slum areas. And one of the important things about giving somebody a, a spatial location is it, it, it means that they get access to a whole load of services. We're doing a project in Calcutta mapping the slums in, uh, in India. And in that situation, if you have a, a, a digital address or a physical address, immediately you get access to a bank account, you can uh, get a water connection, you have all of these things available. So it, it goes way beyond uh, just you know, tracking health data or seeing if people have got access to services. It actually means that many of the things that we all take for granted uh, become possible once you but have. But what is a digital address? You just have a like coordinate where you live. Well, yeah, there's a there's there's a few system around. Google uh, do one. Uh, like a GPS coordinate. Sorry. Like a GPS. It coordinate. is. It's a sort of alphanumeric code, but you can look at the code and you can tell a bit like our addresses roughly where in the city it is because it needs to be uh, sequential. So people can deliver services, but it, it works very well. I'm, if anyone's interested, I can share details on that. Yes, please, we have a oh, question. Th yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mats Målqvist, Uppsala University. Uh, you actually already, in one way, I answered the question that I had, because I, you were showing the Manhattan planning, and my question is, what can we learn from, from our mistakes in, in uh, w uh, more high-income settings when we have done urban planning that we can, so to say, leapfrog development uh, when upgrading slums uh, in, in low-income settings? I think per per perhaps the most important thing, and, and this project is a, a very clear example, is that you know we, we have to fully understand what the community need, and they're the ones that hold the key to the best possible design of infrastructure. I mean, I wouldn't have in my wildest dreams thought when I was asked to go and put in you know, basic services that a road would be top of the list. That, you know, who am yeah. I to say? But the community were the ones decided, and they were the ones who, sh who, who explained why they needed it. And I mean, the main reasons were security, uh, access, of course, but also the thing which we really didn't, uh, really uh, was amazing, was the fact that this is used as the open space in the slums where there's no area at all. It's where people go and socialize in the evening. On it's the road? Where, yeah, on the road. The road becomes, you know. Now, I mean, I know that there's many schemes in New York, example, where they close the streets off on a Sunday and, you know, people use it to socialize. But this idea of this dual space, for me, is a, is a, is a great opportunity, you know. Uh, if, you, if you look around the world, in, in, in Europe in particular, there's huge out-of-town shopping malls with very big par car parks next to them, which are not used for 90% of the time. Perfectly, you know, tarmac surface, which is only used for four hours a day, uh, probably at the weekend. What an incredible waste of resources. I mean, you know, can we repurpose uh, those <laughs> facilities and use them for other, other purposes? There's some good thinking that can be done, I think, to improve. Thank you very much, Graham. You. Oh, you also get the children's book Fantastic. from our most famous Astrid Lindgren, Ronja okay. Röver, Dotter. It's, so uh, it's a great book. You can my daughter will be delighted. Uh, you should read it. I'll read it too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>